All right, so the presentation today is for administrative reviews and claim redeterminations, which are two different types of provider appeals for the Oregon Health Plan. All right, in our discussion points today, we are going to have some introductions. Uh, we'll talk about some definitions for benefit plan coverage and the difference between uh, claim redeterminations and administrative reviews. Also, we'll talk about the provider appeals process, uh, when to request a review, and also the form OHP 3085, which is a fairly new form. Is that correct? Updated form. Okay. So we'll talk about that briefly. So what I'm going to do is I have a list of folks here on the slide. So I'm just going to have us go around the room and introduce ourselves. I'm at the bottom of the list there. I'm the Medicaid program trainer. And my name is Jennifer Smith. I'm Angel Winya. I'm the hospital policy analyst. Nathan Roberts. I'm the medical surgical policy analyst. I'm Nisua Patriz uh, with a wide variety of Elaine Hasty and Counter Data Liaison Z Worker. Judy Watson. Okay. Ms. Mayhew, Provider Services. Judy Brazier, the Lead Worker for Provider Services. Anna Jones, Medical Review Coordinator with the Medical Management Unit. All right, very good. And I believe we're going to have Jesse Anderson, who is also a policy analyst, um, on the line in just a few minutes. All right, so let's begin with definitions. You'll find these in Oregon Administrative Rule 410-120. Uh, we'll start with CALM. So CALM is the Citizen Alien Waived Emergency Medical. If you see this in our systems, it's represented by CWM as a benefit plan. So this is an Oregon Health Plan benefit for aliens that have been granted lawful temporary resident status or lawful permanent resident status under the Immigration and Nationality Act. We have a separate benefit plan for them. Uh, provider appeals. This is a, an OHP enrolled provider can appeal an OHP decision in which the provider is directly adversely affected. So it includes all of the following. So if you have a denial or a limitation of payment for services provided, a denial related to an NCCI edit, National Correct Coding Initiative. Uh, denial for the of the provider's application for new or continued participation. Uh, also, sanctions imposed or intended to be imposed by OHP on the provider or entity. And OHP overpayment determination. So these are all reasons for provider appeals. All right, a few more here. We have a claim breed determination, which is an appeal for a denial of payment allowed, a limitation of payment allowed, prior authorization decision, or overpayment determination for services provided, a contested case, which we won't discuss that one today. We're going to be discussing administrative review and claim redetermination today. But a contested case is an appeal for notice of sanctions imposed or intended to be imposed to deny, suspend, or revoke a provider number. And then administrative review is all other provider appeals. Okay, so let's continue with benefit plan coverage. You'll find this in Oregon Administrative Rule 410-120-1210. And these are OHP benefit packages. I put benefit packages and benefit plans because on the MMIS system, uh, the provider web portal into that system, you see benefit plan. 
but in our Oregon administrative rules, you see the term benefit packages. So I like to use both. Uh, an OHP member's benefit plan determines the level of coverage for that member. And the benefit plans include all of the following. So we have OHP plus. The system code for that is BMH. OHP with limited drug, which is BMM or BMD. And then we have CALM and CALM plus. There are other benefit plans that you might see on the system, um, but they are not one of the basic benefit plans that we're discussing today. So BMH, BMM, or BMD is basically maximum OHP benefits. Uh, the limited drug has to do with that person having Medicare coverage, so you'll see either BMM or BMD. Uh, CALM, we just talked about that, that's emergency benefits only. And then CALM Plus, it's OHP benefits like OHP Plus, but with some additional exclusions, and this is for pregnant CALM members. And you can find all this information at the link at the bottom of the page. All right, so a little bit more about CALM coverage. These are emergency medical services. They're defined by 42 CFR. Okay, so sudden onset of a medical condition manifesting itself by acute symptoms of sufficient severity, including severe pain, such that the absence of medical attention could reasonably be expected to result in placing the patient's health in serious jeopardy, a serious impairment to bodily functions or serious dysfunction of any bodily organ or part, and labor and delivery. So those are the things that are covered for CALM. And just a note there, the prudent layperson standard does not apply to CALM emergency definition. And these are some CALM exclusions. And these services would not be covered even if they're sought as emergency services. So we have several services, including prenatal, postpartum care, uh, preventive care, family planning, private duty nursing. I don't want to just read through all of them. But these are never going to be covered for a Callum client. And they're also never going to be redetermined to be paid. So if they have denied uh, and you submit a provider appeal, these ones will not pay even if sought for emergency services. All right, Callum Plus. So this is the benefit plan that is like OHP Plus with some exclusions, but it's designed for uh, Callum members who are pregnant. And these are exclusions that will never be paid for a Callum Plus member. Uh, postpartum care, except when it's provided and billed as part of a global package. Uh, sterilization, abortion, death with dignity, and hospice. So I do want to uh, just say again that these are things that are never covered for Callum Plus members. So if a provider appeal comes across for a Callum Plus member for one of these services, then it's never going to pay. All right, and I'm going to pause for a minute. Looks like we have some questions coming in. And we'll talk about when a provider appeal is not necessary. Oh, we have a question about handouts. I did uh, attach the handout to the webinar panel, so you should be able to find that over there. All right, we'll go ahead and move on. Okay, so when a provider appeal is not necessary. So we'll talk a little bit more about benefit plan exclusions and some common claim errors. Okay, so some benefit plan exclusions. Again, this is talking about CALM and CALM Plus. So slides 10 and 11, they list exclusions, so services that are never covered for CALM and CALM Plus members. Again, OHP will never cause an appeal or redetermination to pay for excluded services, even if they're sought as emergency services. And other OHP benefit plans, just since we're not outlining uh, what any exclusions might be, I want to state that they're subject to the Health Evidence Review Commission's prioritized list. Uh, if you look at the bottom of the page, with the exception of qualified Medicare beneficiaries, because we follow Medicare's rules for them. Uh, and all other OHP benefit plans are subject to the OHP general rules. 
So when a service for a Cowan member is not an excluded service, you need to always indicate if the service was emergent. So on your institutional claim, you would enter one as the admit type, and that would indicate emergency. And on the professional claim, you indicate it by entering a Y in the emergency field. Okay. Also, when a provider appeal is not necessary. Um, so for DRG, that's Diagnosis Related Group, uh, DRG is a payment methodology for a hospital service. And if the payment is incorrect, you would want to work with Provider Services Unit uh, to work through that payment in discrepancy. Uh, also, retroactive eligibility. So it's the responsibility of the provider to verify eligibility prior to billing and to bill according to the member's coverage date. So if you have a member that has retroactive eligibility or they indicate to you that they have retroactive eligibility, you would want to work with Provider Services Unit on that. All right, and then billing area errors. So before submitting for an appeal, you want to verify that all measures have been taken to resolve the claim. And this may require resubmission of claims and claim adjustments on some paid claims. Here's just a few common claim errors. And these would be indicated on your EOB and um, on your remittance advice as an EOB, sorry, or on the provider web portal as an ART code. So a common error we have is the recipient is covered for private insurance. If you get that error, you just need to go to the third party payer section and uh, enter the adjustment reason code from the EOB. Also a mismatch with PA procedure or diagnosis. In that case, you would want to contact the medical management unit to change the PA before submitting the claim. And recipient name and number disagree. You would check the member's ID and resubmit. Usually this is a mismatch due to a paper claim uh, that didn't read the name right or didn't read the member ID right. Uh, or it could be an EDI claim where uh, the name and ID didn't match. Could also be a hyphenated name, something like that, that could cause this error. So at the bottom of the page, and again at the end of the presentation, there's the provider services unit information. So don't feel like you have to write that down right now. All right, and let's talk a little bit about what provider appeals are. Uh, we do have a couple questions that have come in. I'll go ahead and take those before we move on. Uh, can patients, I just skipped around on me one second. Can patients be billed for any of the excluded services for the CALM and CALM Plus plans? If it's not covered, then patients can be billed. So you do have to have a client agreement to pay uh, on file at your office with that client. It also, it's, it's outlined in the general rules, but there has to be a discussion with the client that the service is not covered. Uh, they should know exactly what the service should cost. And that agreement to pay should be on file signed by both the provider and the patient. So in that case, then yes, you would be able to bill them for non-covered services. That does not mean it's a service that's covered and not paid. There's a difference. It has to be something that we would not pay for, so the excluded services. Okay, um, next question, and I think this will be Provider Services Unit. Uh, sometimes retro eligibility is obtained months later. Uh, how can these be appealed as this doesn't appear to address this? So, if somebody has retroactive eligibility and it doesn't go into the system until months later, then how would they resolve that? It wouldn't be a provider appeal because that person is a covered OHP member on the date of service. So they would work with provider services unit on that, correct? They wouldn't appeal it. I don't know why they couldn't do Okay, very they good. Should. So you should be able to get the information from provider and services. And they should be able to rebuild. And exactly. So again, you want to take all measures 
uh, all reasonable measures before submitting a appeal. So in the event that someone did have retroactive eligibility, then uh, you might need to resubmit the claim once the person is in the provider web portal in the MMIS showing as eligible. Right. Do you have something to add for if it's if it's an um, if the let's say it's a baby and the eligibility for the child was retroactively went back, could be up to two years because of an audit. Then the provider needs to show documentation of that uh, because they probably had their money taken back wait by uh, all, uh, by OHP, so they need to document that, put a cover of some sort or another, showing that this child had retro eligibility, and when it occurred approximately, so that the plan then get that. Otherwise, they're probably going to just. That's in the case of with the right. They retro it. All right, I'm going to go back. So provider appeals, including administrative reviews, claim redeterminations, uh, you'll find this in OAR 410-120-1560. So appeals include claim redeterminations, contested cases, and administrative reviews. We uh, talked about those on slide five, and I gave you a definition of each. Uh, again, we'll not, we will not talk about contested cases at this training. Uh, so provider appeals are initiated by a timely request. They are in writing from the provider. Uh, timely means that it's within 180 days from the fee-for-service decision, uh, within 30 days from the date of the CCO decision after the provider has completed the CCO appeals process. Uh, you must provide a clear written expression of disagreement with a fee-for-service or CCO decision. Uh, it's no specific format, it just has to be clear. And identify the decision and the reason for your disagreement. So that's what starts the process for provider appeals. Uh, some special considerations. If the request is not timely, then the request must be supported by a written statement explaining why it's late. And then OHP will determine whether the failure to file the request was caused by circumstances beyond the control of the requester. And OHP may refer the request to the Office of Administrative Hearings. The provider appeal proceedings will take place in Salem unless otherwise agreed upon by all parties. And then evidence for the appeal. So the burden of evidence in support of the appeal is on the provider. And prior to requesting an appeal, you want to consider that claim payments are made only for services that are adequately documented and billed in accordance with OAR 410-120-1280 and all other applicable administrative rules. And then that all applicable administrative rules establishing the conditions uh, under which services, supplies, or items are covered. So again, that's a fancy way of saying that you want to cover all your bases before submitting a provider appeal. And that may require some uh, claim resubmission or adjustment. Okay, so provider appeals processes. Uh, you'll find this information in OAR 410-120, 1570 through 1580. And here's just a simple diagram of the process. So provider, the provider requests an appeal, and then OHP reviews the request. So at this point, I do want to let you know that during step two, when OHP does its initial review, this is where it's determined whether this is a claim redetermination or a, um, why can't I think of the other word now? <laughs> Administrative review, there it is. I've only said it 18 times so far. All right, so this, in this second step, that's where that's determined. That's not anything that you have to decide on your side. You're just submitting a provider appeal, and then we're taking these processes. Uh, so the last step is that OHP makes a decision on the appeal, whether it's administrative review or claim redetermination.
So a claim redetermination, just so you understand the difference, and this is a little bit of a recap on what we've already said, uh, but claim redeterminations are an appeal for a denial of payment, a limitation of payment, a prior authorization decision, um, or overpayment determination for services provided. An administrative review is all other providers, provider appeals of OHP decisions. So if they're not considered to be claim redeterminations or contested cases, then they become an administrative review, and these usually address uh, legal or policy issues. All right, so step one, we're back to where the provider is making a written request for review, again, within 180 days of the original claim adjudication date. Uh, it includes all information needed to support a change in the decision. So this could be letter of explanation, medical records. Uh, we want to know the specific service, supply, or item for review. Uh, detailed justification copies of the original claim and denial notice or remittance advice, and additional information and or medical documentation. So that all needs to be in your initial request. Does anyone have anything to add to that? Okay. If you're um, doing one, that, but then someone just as a reminder with a member that's in a CCO, 30 days rather than... Right. Yes, this is a fee-for-service definition. And then reasons for provider appeal. So the requester must demonstrate one or more of these reasons. So a below the line condition or treatment pair that is justified under the comorbid rule. Uh, the treatment is part of a covered complex procedure and or related to an existing funded condition. Uh, maybe the service is not listed on the prioritized list, but it may be covered under OARs. So you can see that specific OAR there. Uh, the service satisfies the Callum Emergency Service Criteria. And I just want to note there at the bottom that this is the only evidence that will change a coverage determination for a Callum member. It has to be a Callum Emergency Service and not excluded. Uh, or medical documentation of applicable evidence-based practice literature that is consistent with the condition or service. Okay, and that continued. Uh, we're still in the demonstrating one or more of the following. Uh, the service satisfies the prudent layperson definition of emergency medical condition. Again, that does not apply to Callum emergency. Uh, the service was intended to prolong survival or palliate symptoms. I don't know how to say that word. Is it palliate? That word, palliate, okay. Due to expected length of life consistent with the HERC statement of intent for comfort, palliative care. I've always said palliative. Okay, and the service should be covered where uh, denial was due to technical errors and omissions within the prioritized list. Uh, could be misapplication of a fee schedule, or the claim was denied as a duplicate when it was not a duplicate. And then the last slide on this, I believe, again, we are still continuing our list of one or more of the following reasons for redetermination. Uh, incorrect data items on the claim, errors with MMIS, that's the Medicaid Management Information System. Uh, service was provided without prior authorization, except for those authorizations subject to provision outlined in OAR. Or the service is a covered diagnostic service. So lots of reasons for provider appeal. Three pages worth. And then we get to step two. So this is where OHP does its review. And again, this is where it's determined whether it's a claim redetermination or an administrative review. Uh, they, we review all supplied documentation and applicable laws. And we may request additional information during this step if necessary. Step three is the OHP decision. So this is the OHP's decision is the final decision that's outlined in OAR 410-120-1570. Uh, it's also an order. And uh, in Oregon Regulatory Statute 183.484, 
and the procedures in OAR 137-004-0080 through 0092 apply to the final decision. Uh, claim redetermination results, approvals are evidence on the remittance advice, and denials, you are sent a notice with explanation of the denial. And then we do have a few reasons for immediate denial. Uh, so if the provider appeal is not submitted timely, or required information is not submitted with the request, or if additional information is requested and it's not submitted within 14 business days from the date of request. So those are all reasons for immediate denial. All right, and then we have step three. This is just the difference between, this one is for administrative review whereas the other one, I'll go back up for a minute, was a claim redetermination decision. So the final step, step three, is a little bit different for both of those. So OHP's administrative review decision, again, it's final. Uh, it's binding on all parties. It's an order under Oregon regulatory statute. And then um, Oregon regulatory statute and procedure, procedures in Oregon administrative rules apply to the final decision, and administrative review results are sent to involved participants in writing within 30 calendar days of the conclusion of the administrative review proceeding. All right, and we're going to talk a little bit about the form. Again, this is a revised form for provider appeals. So you want to use this form every time you submit a provider appeal. Uh, you can find the form on the OHP website. There's a link right there on the second bullet and also a direct link at the bottom of the page. And you do want to include required and supporting documentation with the form. And the form is pretty uh, straightforward. We have sections for the requesting provider, the service information, the decision, uh, the reasons for review, and then supporting documentation that's included with the form. Okay, we also have the mailing address. If you look right above uh, where you start to fill out the form, that's where you would mail your appeal. I was looking for a phone number. I don't think there is one on there. Um, but you can contact Provider Services Unit um, if needed. All right, so last but not least, we have some resources and contacts, and then we will open it up for any more questions that have come in. Uh, so some resources for you. I talked about a lot of Oregon administrative rules. Uh, I think all of them are in this rule book, the ones that I actually pointed out. So the Medical Assistant General Rules Program, there's a link to that. Uh, also, there's an OHP Tools for Providers page. There's an OHP forms page. That's where you would find the 3085. And I actually noticed a question did come in about the client agreement to pay. You can find that form on the OHP forms page as well. Okay, and your OHP contacts, and I'll go ahead and leave this slide up while we take some questions. Uh, we do have the provider services unit listed there, uh, provider training, and also the medical management unit. Okay, so we left off at uh, what is the best way to get third-party information out of your system? We have multiple patients that we have had trouble getting this done. So the third-party information in our system uh, should be on the eligibility file for the member. If we know about third-party liability, then it is listed on their eligibility file. So that's where you get it. Uh, next question, can we email our questions at the email address instead of calling in. Uh, yes, that's why we provide the email address there, so that's fine. Uh, regarding patients being billed, do you have a sample of an agreement? Okay, that's the one I was remembering. So yes, we do have the client agreement to pay, again, on the OHP forms page. 
And I don't think, do we require them to use our form? It just has to have all the elements, yeah. right? They can use, they can. Yeah, you can create your own form. It just has to have all the same elements as our form. Might be easier to just use this. <laughs> okay. All right, we've got some specific questions coming in. Um, I'm going to read it, but we might have to have you email this one to us. If a patient is passed. 60 days postpartum as Callum Plus and orders DME supplies such as test strips and lancets and no longer plus eligible, is the patient then responsible or will we need agreement on file? So does that make sense to you? Okay. Okay, so at that point you do need agreement. So the person is still an OHP member even though they're Callum, right? Right. Right, but their benefit changes regular Callum and then right. that's not covered under regular. Right, but for Callum clients, we still need a client agreement to pay, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Okay, I'm not sure I understand this one. Uh, how many levels of appeals? we do for Callum members. So Mary, if you can give us a little bit more information on that one. Uh, <laughs> All right, so next question, please discuss use of admin type five for trauma in reference to Callum appeals. Uh, so on slide 13, we talk about admin type one uh, but we don't talk about admin type 5. So uh, right now it's only 1, and we're looking into whether or not 5 will work for that. Okay, what steps should be taken if services were provided but no authorization was obtained? We build the claim and now have a denial for no authorization. They can request a retro authorization, right. but if the client was not retroactively enrolled, it would be denied. Okay. That would be considered a provider error. Okay, so they would just call the medical management unit? No, they would need to submit it in writing. Okay. So retroactive authorization in writing? Um, next question, would we go through this same process if a local caseworker denies a case? Uh, no, that's a separate issue. This is for claims for OHP members. Next question, where do we mail the request? And that was on the form page. Let me look back at my page here. Uh, provider services, 500 Summer Street Northeast, mail E44, Salem, Oregon, 97301. It is on slide 31 uh, as part of the form, right before the fields where you would start filling out the form. Uh, it does show you the mailing address there. How many levels of appeals can we do for Callum members? For a fee for service provider appeal, it is only if you do a redetermination or an administrative appeal. And for a CCO, they go through their CCO first. They don't have Callum. Callum. Okay, so Callum <laughs> members are always fee for service. That's a, a good thing to point out. Okay, so very good. So it's just one level of appeal. And then as OHP reviews the submitted documentation, they decide, we decide whether it is redetermination or administrative review, and then our decision is final. It's based on the criteria. Okay.
When we receive a denial, who is our contact at the state level for managed care plans? So don't they have... If okay. they have a denial through their plan, they need to talk to their plan first and, and exhaust all of those steps through the plan first. And once they've done that, then they submit all their documentation showing that they have exhausted everything through the plan to through provider services at that point. Okay, so just in case anyone didn't hear that, you would start with your plan if you have a denial from the plan, and you would work through their process of appeals. And then if it's still unresolved, then you would submit uh, to provider services unit, and we would take it from there. But you do have to exhaust um, the CCO process first, or managed care plan. Uh, do we have to indicate on the appeal if it is a redetermination or administrative review? So no, that's something that's decided after it comes to us. We look at the uh, submitted documentation and make that decision here internally at OHP. Can you submit an additional appeal after step three? So we kind of already answered that, right? Uh, so no, our decision is the final decision. Okay, what what time frame does OHA have to complete administrative review? So do we have a time frame? That varies. It's dependent on what the issue is. Okay. Okay, so pharmacy, do we use the same form when we are wanting to appeal an underpayment for a prescription? So does this apply to pharmacies? They have their own opinion. I believe they have their own appeals. We can look into that. Okay, we'll look at that and um, let you know. Uh, can you please say again the three reasons for immediate denial for redetermination? So yeah, let me look back at my slides. I'll come back to that one. The 180-day rule to get our appeal in changed. I thought we had up to one year to appeal. Um, you have up to one year to bill a claim in the first place. So as long as you have billed a service within the 12-month timely filing period, uh, that's a different issue than this. So uh, you do have to bill a service within one year of the date of service. And then if you have billed it within those 12 months, then you do have an additional six months to uh, resolve that claim. But that's really just a claim adjustment and resubmission process there. Um, ladies in Encounter, do you have something to add? That, just that that's for fee for service. Yes. They would want to work through their CCOs on their time and time. Right. Yeah, they are different for CCOs. I have a parent who is appealing a denial. Does that need to happen before we appeal? I think denial. a prior authorization. Is it a claim denial or a prior authorization denial? Kelly, if you could add a little bit of information there. Okay, and we're right now we're circling back to the third party information question. So, uh, Kim, I'm just getting your uh, clarification there. I actually meant how do we get third party information out of your system when the patient no longer has the third party insurance? So, what you would do is you would do uh, an eligibility search for a past date 
a date that they did have that third party insurance, and then the eligibility file will still have that information available. Can appeals be faxed in? Nope. No, they need to nope. be mailed. Okay, so we're getting some duplicate questions. I'm just walking through those. I can tell you the reasons for immediate denial. So I told you I was going to look on my slides and get back to that because that was just a note. So immediate denial is uh, if the appeal is not submitted timely, if the required information is not submitted with the request, or if the additional requested information is not submitted within 14 business days from the date that OHP requested it. I know this is not a claim appeal question, but I've always wondered how to determine the date a claim was paid in MMIS. So on the, uh, you're either going to, on your remittance advice, the date of the remittance advice is going to tell you that, or if you're in the provider web portal looking at the claim, there should be a date of denial or a date paid at the bottom of the claim. If a patient has signed the client agreement to pay form and the office visit is denied due to diagnosis below the line, is the patient still liable for payment? If you have a client agreement to pay and the service is not covered, then you can bill the client. So with an office visit though, because the diagnosis is below the line. No, I don't think so. Uh -uh. I don't think so. Okay. Nope. Right, because it's an office visit is what? Yeah. Yeah, it, it really yeah. depends. Yeah, it has to be a service. And right. It has to be specific to the denial. And the, the form has to say specifically they advise the member in advance that that specific service is not covered, and that's why the member finds it, and so does Right. It can't be blank. Okay, will the slides or the webinar be available for us to see again? So the webinar is being recorded, so it should be available uh, within about a week. Uh, also, the slides, I attach them on the handouts area of the webinar panel on the right side of your screen. I also emailed them to everyone at 9 o'clock. If you did not receive my email, you can go ahead and type in your email address. It's possible that I have the wrong address for you. And I'll make sure that you get them after the presentation. Okay. So I do want to note that retroactive prior authorization, you can find that information in Oregon Administrative Rule 410-120. Dash 1320, section 5. And I'll type that in real quick. Give me just a second. Do you have to use the 3085 form or can a cover letter suffice? You do need to use the form. All right, and there's that Oregon administrative rule we talked about. Can we email a request to find out when the patient's coverage was retroactively added? Because if we are trying to get a retroactive authorization, we only have 90 days from the date of the insurance being added. Um, so if you're 
Yes, they can. They just send it to provider services. And if we can tell, sometimes we can't tell when the eligible was retroed or not. But we we have ways to look. So yes, any any questions like that can go to provider services. Okay. Um, I think what they're saying is, can they send you a request to like let them know when it happened? Oh no. Um, so what you would want to do is either call or email provider services uh, frequently, like maybe once a week or once every two weeks to see if that person's eligibility is on the system. Check in. Check the portal. They can check yeah, you can yeah. also check in the provider web portal. How much time from the date of the denial do we have to request a retro authorization request from the date of denial? There's no time frame based on the date of denial of the claim. If the client was retroactively enrolled, you have 90 days from the date of service. If they were not retroactively enrolled and, you, and the provider failed to request an authorization, that's considered a provider error. Okay, so 90 days from the date of service if they were retroactively enrolled. Okay, and I think we've covered this, but I want to read it uh, one more time just because it's a little bit more detailed. When a patient comes in for a diagnosis that is not life-threatening, so this is a Callum client, I assume, that we're talking about, and the claim is appealed with notes and the claim is denied as a level one, how many appeals can we do? Just the one, right, because the decision is final. Okay. Should an OHP patient be required to sign the waiver form every time they see the physician? No. Uh, you would want there to be a, an OHP client agreement to pay uh, in the event that the service is not covered. So yes, every time the client comes in for a service that is not covered, there needs to be a client agreement to pay on file and there needs to be a discussion with the client about the cost of the service. Prior to services being rendered, yes. that date of service. Right. So prior to services being rendered. So we have lots of questions coming in about specific forms for retroactive authorization requests. And I'm going to go ahead and point you in the direction of that Oregon administrative rule again. Uh, that OAR is 410-120. 1320, Section 5, that's in our general rules uh, book. All right, so a coverage question about Callum Plus. Uh, we've had claims for miscarriages denied. Uh, shouldn't these be payable as pregnancy deliveries? Miscarriages. Do we need to look into it? Okay, so we'll look into the, the question about miscarriages being uh, pregnancy deliveries, and we'll let you know the answer to that. How did she get an example? Yeah, if you have examples of those claims, that would be great if you could send them to the provider services email. And we'd like to take a look at those. You can just put attention Judy and she'll get those. Uh, when the patient no longer has a primary third party but OHP still has it on file, how does the member go about updating OHP? And what do we do at the pharmacy level while we wait for OHP to remove the primary insurance? 
So uh, that is the member needs to talk to their caseworker and get the third party insurance removed. Uh, while you wait for us to remove it, does do you just continue to put in non-covered? There's also a link on our website, right. which I was trying to find, um, okay. that is specific for that, for right. a TPL that, when it's been removed. So if they go to our website, okay, so um, under there's tools a for link. Providers. I believe yeah. it's under there. I can't pull right. it up, though, unfortunately. But it is on there, and they can send the email directly to them okay. to let them know that their other insurance has right. been termed, and they will update it. And is that the health insurance? It's HIG, right? Yeah, HIG. health insurance yeah. group. Okay. Oh, duh. Never say that. Never say it. <laughs> and nobody's responding. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, yeah, lots of these are third party. Oh, yeah, you can bet on that. All right, I'm seeing some email addresses. Okay, so really quick, I would like to go ahead and we've got three minutes. So I'm going to go on the website and see if we can find that HIG update for you. Okay, so here is the OHP website. And I'm gonna go on the left, there's a menu, there's a providers section, and I'm gonna click on tools for providers. I want to say it's on, under one of the questions. I think it so is. you can see there's uh, frequently asked questions. Lots of questions available. I don't see anything about TPL. Is it one of the questions? I don't know if it's one of the questions. Okay, so I'm going to go in my search box here and look for TPL. Okay. We've got copayments. That's not what we're looking for. Would it be the same place where they go to report TPL? Yes, right? Yes. That's all health yeah. insurance. Yeah. Group. Okay, so it we is. found it. Uh, you would go to uh, report that the TPL is there or not at www.reporttpl.org. So there's the address That's right it. there. Yep. All right, and I do want to say we didn't get to every question that came in. There were a lot of repeats, so I kind of tried to just keep going through those um, without rereading anything. So if if there's a question that we didn't get to today uh, that we told you we'd have to research and get back to you, please stay tuned. We'll get that information to you. And I want to thank you for being here today. I hope this has been helpful about the provider appeals process and uh, CalM and CalM Plus benefit plans.